Hi, welcome to Fiber Chats. My name is Irina. I'm the host here. And my guest today comes from Australia, Prue Raymond, otherwise known as Dear Prue. Welcome to my channel, Prue. Oh, thanks, Irina. It's so nice to be here. I, I really love meeting you in New York, and it's just fantastic that we get to continue our conversation. It was so fun, and I can't believe you came all the way from Australia to New York City. <laughs> Tell me like about that. Tell me about your experience at work meeting. So I, I went in 2020 and I had a great time and I was all prepared for 20, uh, for sorry, yeah, for 2021. But because uh, the 2020 event, the 10th anniversary was in January. And then, of course, the world kind of fell apart within a couple of months. Um, so it's so nice to be able to go back um, to join together in um, in real life, face to face in 2023 and to attend classes from world class um, uh, designers, teachers, uh, authors, um, and meet people like yourself as well who are trying to build our ecosystem to support the growth and the continued creativity and connection that people um, can experience through knitting. And I, I just felt that even though I travelled across the world to be there, I felt immediately part of a community that loves and accepts me and um, that I could instantly spark up a conversation with someone and 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 people invited me to dinner and invited me to coffee and things while I was there that I'd never met before and we were you know instant mates because we're all knitters so I, I just think that's really special well tell me how you started tell me your story like how did you My origin story <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I, I learned to knit when I was five. So I'm 41 now. Um, but I, I learned as a small kid. And I think this is a story for many people. They learn because uh, they're uh, usually a female relative um, is trying to keep them occupied while other things are happening or they think, oh, you know, now's probably the time to, to introduce this skill. For me, it was a neighbour who initially got me started. She was um, babysitting and uh, I, I was a bit of a handful. I, I think I still am quite boisterous. <laughs> <laughs> so she got me started I was pretty rudimentary kind of stuff like it was a couple of like skewers from the kitchen drawer and some like random kind of wool that was hang hanging around I didn't even know how why we had wool in the house because no one else needed at that point um but then it was really my grandma that kept me going because we'd go around on a Sunday for for roast and then she would um bring out the English Women Weekly magazines with the cake and the tea so so then it was a bit of a ritual that we'd sit around, look over the magazines. We sort of went every fortnight. So there'd usually be two. So my sister, Rhiannon, who's 18 months younger than me, and I would sit there pouring over the patterns saying, Grandma, what's this? What's this design? How does this work? What's this stitch do? And then trying to kind of um, decode the, the patterns with Grandma. And so you're having an amazing knitter? She was amazing knitter, yeah. She's no longer with us, unfortunately. She passed away some years ago. She, she'd be over 100 now. Um, but, uh, yeah, she was an amazing knitter, knitted all her life, um, knitted for herself. I don't actually recall her knitting for us, um, but she definitely she made us dresses as well. She's a, a dressmaker um, as well. She just had lots of talents, my grandma. So, um, but she would encourage us to keep pushing our skills and keep developing. And I think that's the key, like always learning and having a natural curiosity about knitting is uh, the key to having a long life with knitting um, mm -hmm. instead of just being stuck on the one pattern or the, you know, the one set of patterns because you only work with this particular technique. Yeah, she was always encouraging us to look beyond mm. well when you like do you remember when you first started knitting like as a child right mm. I mean we all start with scarves basically like do you remember some of your first projects yeah so my first scarf was this terrible my first project was a terrible scarf actually and it just kept growing out and I kept it for a long time because and it was still on the the terrible skewers as well <laughs> So um, it, I kept for a long time because it was sort of a reminder of, of my progress as well. It, you could see where I'd started to kind of get it and the tension was evening out. But I think that's also why it took a few years for me to come back and properly engage with it. So I knit when I was five and I was making like little dolls clothes and things but nothing sort of significant um, but then as grandma encouraged us to try different things I started making garments um, and uh, my first garment was um, was this terrible acrylic jumper from the English Women's Weekly magazine uh, with like really wide uh, rib 
um, on it and it was this beautiful burgundy colour. But it was so oversized <laughs> because I knew nothing about gauge at that point. Um, and I, I think Grandma had probably told me to do a gauge swatch and I ignored her like a lot of us do even now, <laughs> you know. Um, and so it really was uh, probably for my dad more than for me and he was a large man at 6'2", I think he was. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, What's your relationship with swatching nowadays? Oh, I love swatching. I think it's an important part. And I really love in Amy's new book, um, uh, ne Neons and Neutrals, how she actually has almost like an ode to swatching in the front of her book and has a completely different approach around play and experimentation and understanding and learning and discovering new opportunities for these wool, that wools that perhaps you didn't think to knit for that particular pattern. But when you combine them and, and you create this palette, you can create something totally unique. Um, so, but for, yeah, for a long time, it was something I had to do and it was about getting gauge rather than about discovering something about the wall. But now I'm definitely in that space where it's more, what could this wall share with me? What could I learn from this yarn and how might I use this yarn differently? Like, um, at the moment, I'm actually working with some alpaca from a sheep farm, uh, sorry, an alpaca farm in, um, um, New South Wales. Um, they, they want to work together and have some kind of like collaboration so I'm experimenting with their yarn and I'm really loving trying different things trying different stitches trying different gauges to sort of see what 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 might unfold uh, from that process well when you see yarn right like and wog knitting was obviously like the playground for all of us there mm -hmm. in terms of mm -hmm. yarn. like when you see yarn do you immediately imagine the project or do you have to swatch with it in order to have an idea of what you want to make so Yeah, it depends. Sometimes I start with a like a concept or an idea and I sort of go looking for yarn to match that. And sometimes I'll um, like uh, with this um, Eva tabard that I'm um, I've put out for testing, but I'm going to put another call out again soon. Um, is uh, that the it was the yarn that I I just love the colors and I love the texture of it and um and I love and I love playing with pairing up the colors. And so and then I went okay, let's do this sort of it's sort of to match it with a design and then the design sort of evolved so it started with a concept and it took another direction with because of the yarn and I think I think that's the six the key to success is actually marrying those two two things up not being so committed to a particular yarn or a particular design or concept but just seeing what evolves and being open to see you know where it should go right yeah. well tell me about your knitting career like when did it become a career and what made you decide to turn it into a career yeah so I've had a few different careers to be honest like I um when I left uh, uh school went off to uni uh did an arts degree a, a liberal arts degree um with a major in history um and I was working in a library I was managing a local library and then I decided I'd go off and travel to the UK and work over there for a bit and try and work out my path and it decided to come back to Australia and study teaching. So um, I've been a high school teacher for 16 years and then about three years ago, just before COVID, um, I started working in educational leadership. So I was working at a policy level, um, writing curriculum, working with teachers, teaching teachers how to be better teachers. Um, and then um, uh, on the, as a side line to that, I was running community knitting workshops from about 2017. And that was really just because I needed an extra challenge. I love sharing skills. I love sharing learning. Um, and it, I didn't really think of it as a business. I thought of it kind of as a maybe a side hustle at best but really just community engagement um but then I must have known a thing or two because I did actually get my like I registered for an Australian business number I got a logo you know I was doing some of the things that point to it being a business and not just a hobby and then um it was actually last year I was working um uh, I'd I had a promotion. I was working uh, in uh, education at a quite a high level um, and um, I was getting more opportunities to go travel and teach workshops and um, develop my patterns and so forth. And um, I asked my boss if I could have a, um, a reduction of time in my, in my work, in my day-to-day -day job. And, um, and they said, no, this is a full-time role. We can't give you part-time. 
And I had this really like big moment where I had to sort of weigh up my options. Do I dial back the approve? Or do I, you know, do I try to do everything? And obviously there's only so many hours in the day. And I actually realised I was going to be much more upset and it was much scarier for me to imagine dialing back Dear Prue and making it less and not taking the opportunities than to quit my safe, permanent government job. Uh, and that was that was a big moment of revelation that, you know, this is a real thing and I needed to pursue it. Well, like in your mind, what's the difference between something being a hobby and something mm. being a business? Um, I think I think it's actually a mindset, to be honest. I, th I think it's not, uh, it, um, I mean, there is a definition. There is a definition around, you know, whether you're doing it for profit, whether you're advertising with the uh, an event with the understanding you're going to make a profit. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, I guess, the Australian government has some quite sort of some rules around that. I'm sure it's similar around the world, uh, around your income levels and so forth. But I think it's really a mindset. Are you, are you looking to um, continue to grow and you want to maintain this as a, you know, professional kind of uh, role or are you just having fun with it? But I think it can be difficult, in our, especially in our industry, because there are a lot of people who are, um, I think think they're a hobby, but then the scale of their business, uh, the amount of interactions, the the type of activities they're involved in, mean that they they're really they're really a business and not a hobby. But then they keep it, um, you know, uh, saying I'm a I'm a hobby and therefore I can get away with X Y Z. And it comes becomes quite frustrating when you're operating on two different kind of philosophical levels, even about what it means to have a business in our ecosystem. <laughs> Do you ever get frustrated with like the growth rate or with the performance of your business? I do because I'm I'm an impatient person and knitting actually is um I think one of the antidotes to that to help me to learn patience because it's not a natural attribute that I have. Um so yeah, I, I want everything now. Like I, I want to be traveling all over the world and teaching not just Australia you know not just Australia I mean traveling in Australia is a privilege I'm really happy that I get to do that but um I want a book um yesterday I want to you know I want to set up an online learning management system to share skills um online in a self-paced kind of course um courses I want to do all the things right now but um I realize that I need to dial it back so it's really helpful having other people like Jess from Yarn Trail Victoria and like um Tanya at Yarn Trader where I teach regularly and Charmaine at Yarn Rum who I work with on the fi on Fiber Feast to sound out these kinds of things and um and and to let them sort of um mentor me <laughs> to a degree or a peer mentor in some cases um to say look you know yeah that's great but maybe just breathe <laughs> and just wait and see what evolves and don't push all the things because um yeah sometimes pushing to make something happen uh is exhausting and maybe that's not where you need to expend well that's not where I need to expend my energy um so wait and see where the path takes me because it's always worked out in the in the past well, when you think about writing a curriculum, right, like this is some advanced planning, like it takes, mm. you have to take so many things in consideration, you have to plan it for the whole year. Mm. How good are you with planning your business as far as mm. it goes? Like how far ahead do you plan? <laughs> Um, not that far ahead. Um, I know what I'm doing from now to um, July, <laughs> so end of financial year. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I have some some goals. Um, but then I'm also quite responsive. I, I think you have to be in this industry, uh, especially at the moment. I don't know what um, things are like for you at the moment, but in Australia, our economic um, sort of situations a little bit dicey um but also I, I don't know where things are going to be um so much of my business is reliant on um my profile and a few things are going to drop in the next few months which might give me more opportunities but I can only anticipate where that goes rather than um plan for that 
and it's kind of nice too, to be honest, like because in my previous work it's all been like very much like especially as a teacher, you plan out your entire year of assessments. Um, you plan, you know exactly where you are from hour to hour and there's a bell to tell you that it's now time to move. <laughs> Whereas uh, the way I do things now is very much more organic. Like, you know, I have meetings and, you know, with people like you and, um, and I have um, a schedule that I try to stick to but also... So there's just things that I need to sort of respond to and be open to following the path as it unravels. <laughs> well, I mean, when I'm thinking about being self-employed and running your own business, it all sounds mm-hmm. like very flexible and you you are the boss, whereas in reality you just work like endless hours. So it's like much yeah. more involved <laughs> than being employed from nine to five. What's your oh, yeah. day-to-day looks like? Oh, you're right. Like it's it's funny because, um, well, as a teacher, I was working endless hours anyway. But then I've worked in in an, an office really um, from like 2019 through to 2022, like when I quit last year. Um, so yeah, my day is like I wake up at about 5:30, um, and I start checking messages and responding to people on social media on and email. I know that firsthand because you were responding to me at 5 30 in the morning <laughs> that's right that's right well I mean it's partly because my husband goes to work super early so when he wakes up I wake up and then I spend about an hour or so um just responding to like those initial things or just reading and giving myself time to think about what kind of response I'm going to give to that particular thing um so then I'll have some breakfast and I'll I'm I'll knit over breakfast or I'll look over some stuff and then I'll get stuck into like some of those media emails I am um, I don't have a to-do list I have uh chunks of time in my calendar uh that are color coded um and I know a good week is one where I've got lots of purple in it that's for designing um but a lot of my weeks unfortunately will have a lot of blue which is all admin and accounts <laughs> you know so things like putting in um doing my bookkeeping, which I do myself, um, sending out invoices, things like that, fits into that blue category, um, sending out proposals, which is good too because sometimes that means that I'm going to get a new gig and be able to go out and teach somewhere new and exciting. Um, but, yeah, so I try to balance it out, but sometimes you just have to go with it. There's some weeks where there'll just be more kind of admin type jobs, but then I try to fit in more exciting things the following week. Do you have like some classes that you absolutely love to teach and some classes that you are hesitant to teach? <laughs> um, I, I just, I teach students, not classes. So, you know, I just love um, coming to a, a workshop with all these expectant, excited people. And I love it when I see a student again that I haven't seen for a while or that has come to a previous class and, and is excited to share with me their progress. Um, and then so the the project, whatever it is we're working on, um, is really kind of re- irrelevant. Um, for me, it's more about sharing skills, connecting with others and providing with them with a means to share, to express their creativity. So, um, yeah, and if that, but if there's a, a project that I think doesn't work or people aren't engaging well with, the students aren't, um, getting what they need out of that session then I park that I don't offer that anymore <laughs> um but yeah no it's it's more it's more about the responsive learning in the in the classroom and that's where my teaching background is really useful because I'm um, always think about how to differentiate how to help students set their own learning intentions um uh, so it's it's more about them and their knitting journey rather than about me imparting a very set curriculum on them Right. Like when you mentioned that you're not very patient, are you very patient as a teacher? I hope I come across that way. (laughs) I I do get told, oh, thanks for your patience and whatever. Oh, you're really patient. But I I, I mean, I'm, I'm excited for them to keep moving. So, you know, I do there is a you know internal dialogue that I'm like oh come on like you can do this like but I think part of it is too that I know that people have to get beyond their own brain and their own um self-expectations and their own uh judgment I think sometimes that's what trips people up in fact it's not sometimes it's about probably 98 percent of the time it's self-judgment that's tripping them up and not anything physiological or anything to do with their you know their 
uh, there's there's no limitation on their ability. It's that they are second guessing and thinking, oh, I look silly or I feel silly right now and people are judging me, but it's really them judging themselves. Um, and so they're not focused on the task. They're, they're, they're distracted by their inner dialogue. <laughs> when you go and you take classes at the festival like WOG, yeah. do you learn like other people's teaching techniques? Do you judge them? <laughs> <laughs> do you like think, oh, I would do that better. I would explain that better. Like what's- well, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons I went to Vogue um, because it's it's got the best array of classes. Like there is no other festival that offers that range of classes, um, that diversity of techniques and that um, level of um, professional knitter, designer, author. Um, yeah there's nothing of that nature and the 300 classes over four days like it's just <laughs> insane insane but um yeah so I deliberately picked out which classes I wanted to go to because I wanted to watch those teachers as much as learn the skills so there was a little bit of you know column a column b um but I mean I was so impressed with um yeah the patience of the teachers the the, the skill um, the way they shaped their classes, like, um, and I, I did give each of them a little bit of feedback, <laughs> whether it was like a bit cheeky or not, but, you know, um, mostly I gave them all positive feedback because um, I really loved how like Leslie Ann Robinson, um, she uh, did her brioche, one of her brioche classes. Um, and she really thinks about how to inculturate her student into her design world. And the way she does that and a really simple thing she does is she um, puts her class notes in the same format as her pattern notes. So when you, if you've already um, bought one of her patterns and you come to her class, you instantly feel comfortable whether you know it or not because you're familiar with the language of her patterns and the uh, there's a literacy of how to read her pattern or how to read her notes that, that instantly puts a student at ease. Um, and and on the flip, if you come into her class and you've never engaged with her before and you go through her, her instructions for the class and then you go to buy a pattern, you'll be familiar with it because you've already been through that process. So things like that I really love. I think it shows a really good uh, awareness of um, how teaching materials can support the learning process and and that it's an ongoing process. It's not just a once-off engagement, but it's an ongoing um, process. So, yeah, that's just one example. How do you think you've ter- changed as a teacher, like, over the years? Um, so how have I changed? Um, so for me, my, my, my evolution as a teacher has been 16 years, you know. So um, when I first started teaching in high school, I was um, uh, I was very I- idealistic, um, but also didn't have. I, I definitely wasn't as patient then. I, I sort of found it it was quite exhausting. <laughs> um, but as time's gone on, like I've become a lot more. I can I notice a lot more. I'm more responsive. I'm not as fixated on getting through the curriculum. I understand that there's a much bigger learning story going on around me. Um, and so I'm more more focused on drawing out the student's own learning story and picking up from that point. Um, so, yeah, I think there's a min- maturity, definitely. Um, <laughs> I think I'm, I'm a lot better at waiting and listening um, and um, in the classroom rather than just going, all right, we're going ahead with now I'm ready to do this. <laughs> so, yeah. Do you feel like children learn different from adults? Uh, it's really funny. I, I, I don't think that any different. <laughs> uh, I, well, I mean, I was teaching um, young adults anyway. So, so from 13 to, you know, 18 uh, for a long time. And I think they're very similar. I think um, by that age, young people have a real sense of self. They have a, a series of skills. In fact, they're probably a little bit more open. As adults, we become 
experts in our fields, in our in our work, in our home life, in our families, we have a different, you know, a position of authority um, and a sense of who we are. And sometimes it's harder to break that down and put yourself back in the learner position um, than it is as a teenager. But even some teenagers can be really hard to sort of, uh, that they don't want to be seen to not know something. Um, and so I think part of my work is actually reminding people that learning is hard and that's okay and that they're there to learn not to be the expert that, you know, and also I'm an expert because I've spent a long time developing those skills, but I'm still learning as well. Um, so I think that was also a good thing to signpost about going to Vogue Knitting, that I'm still a learner and I'm still learning and I intend to keep learning. And my currency as a teacher is only relevant as long as I'm still a learner as well. Right. Well, there are certain yeah. techniques that have bad rap among the knitters. Some <laughs> well-deserved, some are just like, I don't know why, right? So brioche would be one of them and Tarja, Interlock. Like there, there are a few that people yeah. who even knit all their life just afraid to even touch. Yeah. How do you encourage your students to try some new to them techniques? Mm. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm pretty lucky in some ways that um, uh, people trust me. <laughs> and so, like, I, I have a brioche class coming up um, and it's sold out within a few days because people are really keen to learn and they, and they trust me to help them do that. Um, so I, I do think that's that is the key to any learning is is trust. It's trusting yourself and trusting the teacher, um, and just having having a go. And also, I think a sense of playful curiosity. You know, let's see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? We're not making anything significant. We're just having a play and seeing what happens. So I, I think that's that's also a good attitude. And it's probably where swatching comes helpful That's because right. you can just make a little swatch. You don't have to necessarily make a whole mm -hmm. garment with this new technique. Yeah, totally. Exactly right. And and then you sort of you test different things. You go, okay, what if I use different needles? What if I hold the yarn differently? What if I was to do this or if I was to try doing it at a different time of day or you know and that's why I'm a big believer in having multiple projects too because you put something down rest yourself and your brain and your hands by moving to something else and then you go back to it and your brain has had time to back load stuff like a computer it's doing its own kind of loading in the background and then you come back to it and it's suddenly easier or it's you know makes more sense Tell me about your design approach. Like, how do you... Well, first of all, let's talk about your first design being published. Tell me about that experience. Yeah, so um, I was designing for a long time and I, I've designed a few things that are just kind of... There's no pattern for them. <laughs> I've just kind of made them because I wanted to wear them. <laughs> um, but then um, I started designing things for my classes because I've always had this strong... Um, I guess, sense of uh, intellectual property that I, I don't want to teach from someone else's notes. So I design my classes are, are usually project-based and I design something for the students and for the class. So I didn't even realise I was actually writing patterns. I was writing teaching notes, <laughs> um, instructions for the class. But, yeah, so really my first proper design with instructions was Ambition Beanie and I still teach that. Um, and I just put that up on, on uh, Ravelry and then went, oh, I've published a pattern. <laughs> and that was kind of exciting. And that was in 2020. I put it up there. I'd actually written it three years before, but I finally put it up online in 2020. I went, I did a thing. I published a pattern. Um, but I think the most exciting thing was last year when my um, my patterns started being published through Deep South Fibres. So now they can people can buy my patterns in yarn stores or yarn stores can order my patterns in wholesale and stock them on the shelves. And so when I when I went into Yarn Trader and they got their delivery of Deep South Fibers patterns and my patterns are among them. That was a really, really exciting moment as well <laughs> to, to look at myself on the cover of this pattern. And <laughs> yeah, it was cool. <laughs> you remember your first celebrity moment when somebody recognized you in public? Oh, 
No, but I do, I don't remember, but I do I do really love it when people come up to me and like, actually I went into a school the other day and one of the teachers walked into the room and or one of the the um, leadership staff and was like oh, I follow you on Instagram and I'm so excited to see. You. <laughs> and I, I had this moment where like I'm I'm nobody <laughs> and like you know I'm just I'm just a teacher like you, but um yeah it was really sweet and I I think. I totally get it because I, I fangirled so hard when I saw um, Nora Gorn in New York because, you know, I think she's incredible. Like she's such an incredible designer. Um, I uh, heard her talk about her design process and she's sort of part scientific endeavour, part artistic exploration. Um, yeah, so I was super excited to meet her and I was wearing a sweater that she designed, so that was also really exciting. <laughs> well, do you have yeah. like any plans for your designs do you think in terms of design so is it the inspiration strikes and you have to sit down and sketch it and start knitting yeah there's a bit of that yeah yeah where I'll just like I'll have an idea um often it's a little bit structured to be honest like it's um I think okay I want to do a class to share these skills and if it's three hours then it needs to be this size garment and this size wool and da, da, da. and so that's quite restricting at times um I think it sort of it's it's good it's it's a it's a you know a, a design process that's used in lots of industries but also it probably inhibits my artistic side because I'm more about like the the outcome and the the product and the prototype and and so forth but in um August last year I um I had a a, a week uh, we have a thing called um South Australian Living Artists Month in August every year and um uh, we artists will exhibit so I had a, a live exhibit basically where I sat in the window of uh, yarn trader my local yarn store and every day I came in and I knitted and then I unraveled everything at the end of the day <laughs> and that was really freeing because it was more about just listening to the wall um listening to myself and what I wanted to make and and I was overnight thinking of different things I wanted to play with uh, or different textures I wanted to experiment with and then I'd come in the morning and I'd sort of look through my my um basket of yarn and and see what where I was going to go for the day and I, I want to do more of that just kind of experimenting and and um seeing what evolves out of that uh, rather than such a regimented you know entrepreneurial innovate innovation and design kind of process that I currently tend to use mm. right well do you ever have days when you don't have any ideas when you have creative block um no I don't really because uh I, I just go to I just knit <laughs> so if I if I experience a sense of like I don't know what to do right now there's always knitting you know I've always got something on my needles um and and I I do knit other people's patterns as well because it's like getting to know someone having a conversation with someone and I learn something through that process about how their brain works I think um maybe I'm not just learning their brain maybe there's a design team that I'm learning from as well but I really appreciate that conversation and that sort of recalibrates me and then I uh, it sort of sparks something else like a what if um and I think that's a really healthy kind of way to get back onto the track to go what if this and what if I was to iterate that or try this or or something something unravels and starts to loosen up in me when I knit so yeah and I have lots of sketches and things that I go back to um or um I've also noticed and been sort of heartened to realize that I can also take an, another pattern that I've already published and start playing with our motif and taking it further because I really love how Stephen West does that he'll have like a motif in a in a shawl and then he'll take that and put it into a sweater or into a beanie and I'm like well that's that's genius like <laughs> you know you don't have to start a brand new chart like could just sort of iterate that that concept and take it into a different direction different garment do you ever mm. compare yourself to other designers? Do you compare your success to success of other designers or is it just a source of inspiration and motivation? 
Oh, totally. It's a, it's inspiration and motivation. Like we were all on, on our own journey and we all operate in our own ecosystems. Like I think I would do myself a disservice if I was to compare myself with um, like my my three favourite designers would be Andrea Mowry, um, Nora Gorn and Stephen West. Um, but they operate in completely different ecosystems to me, I think. Um, but I think I, I have an opportunity here in the, in our Australian system, um, and I and I'm developing some really good relationships now that I think will influence where my designs go in the future. Um, and so I'm just curious to see where it goes because this feels like a dream. Like this isn't something I planned for my for my life. It's something I hoped, but nothing I planned for. So everything I get to do is kind of a gift. <laughs> so I, I feel very lucky. I don't feel like I'm. Um, I can judge this because it's it's amazing. <laughs> well, how is your family reacting to the fact that you like quit your full time job and went into your previous hobby as a full time job? I think there's different levels of understanding about what it is I do um, and what it involves. Um, most people are really supportive. I, I think it has helped that we've come out of this um, life-changing, world-changing experience of COVID uh, and how that's, you know, completely, we've, we've done things we've never done before, like shutting down entire cities and working from home for periods of time. And I think that's really been a, a break that's kind of made people that there's that this great resignation movement going on and things like that. But I, I like to the other version of it, which is the great reflection. And I think a lot of people are reflecting on what's important, what's what's driving me, where do I want to go, how do I want to live my life, what do I want my relationships to look like. Um, and I've basically done that but just actually then taken a leap in, uh, into that <laughs> even further than others maybe would like to but feel fearful of. But I'm lucky that my husband's really supportive. He was scared. Uh, when I put in my resignation, I came home and I said, oh, yeah, quit quit my job and stuff. And he's like, what? Can you take it back? <laughs> it was like, you really did it. He didn't believe me because, I mean, I'm someone that throws ideas around at home. Oh, how about we do this? How about we do that? And he's learned that some things are just kites that will go flying into the sky and he doesn't need to tug on the string he can just let it fly and it will fly off and it's an, another thing and then other times he knows to to grasp onto that and help me kind of you know tether the kite a little bit you know um but yeah he didn't anticipate me actually quitting my job but um no he's very very supportive and uh you know he's had a few career changes in his life too and he understands that this is something you have to do um but yeah i mean it doesn't actually matter what other people think to be honest uh the main thing is i think I'm, i only really care about him um and his his opinion and whether we're a team and on the same page so it did scare me a little bit that he didn't get that it, i was really doing it <laughs> when i did it um but yeah we're all good now we're, we're walking together on this path and um yeah it's it's exciting hmm. did you have a single day when you regretted doing it no I have days where I'm afraid of like where's uh where how am I going to build up my bank balance again having gone to New York <laughs> and spent a ton of money on yarn and 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 the trip was expensive but also I trust that if it's, it felt like the right thing to do and that things are going to be okay you know things things will evolve and money will appear and they have <laughs> um you know I'm still doing a little bit of relief teaching every now and then to sort of top uh, up my income because unfortunately I, I can't quite make a living off what I'm doing right now with my designing and teaching knitting to be you know really frank but that's okay because I've still got other skill sets I can draw on I can I can go into a school and teach um, uh, for a day and relief teaching or casual relief teaching I'm not sure what the term is uh, supply teaching or whatever um, and uh, I'm happy to do that. And actually, it's really nice to reconnect with kids in the classroom and um, uh, in, a, in a different way. Yeah. How do you think uh, growing, like living in Australia, being surrounded by the nature that surrounds you, how does that influence you? 
Well, where I live, I'm actually quite urban. Um, so I'm in, I live in Adelaide, um, which is the capital, capital of South Australia. So Australia is actually about the size of the US, um, uh, but we we are flipped. You know, they talk about being down under, but we, we're kind of flipped. So uh, where I live in the central part of Australia, central coast of Australia, um, it's kind of like a Mediterranean climate. Think, you know, think Rome. <laughs> um, and uh, so we have beautiful beaches. Uh, we have the Adelaide Hills, which kind of forms a bit of an arc around uh, you have to Google Adelaide and have a look at images of the city because the CBD sits there with the, there's almost like an auditorium of the hills behind and then it's it's the head towards west towards the coast. So I'm sort of just north of the city um, and, uh, yeah, it's quite urban. But then it only takes an hour to get out to the countryside um, and we've got beautiful farms like um, I um, went out to the Adelaide Hills to visit Susie Horn um, and her fin sheep. I'm, I've got an article coming out in uh, issue 17 of Liner um, where I wrote an article about Susie and her fin sheep um, in the Adelaide Hills and giving a bit of a picture of our Australian wool scene. Um, yeah, and, and in May I'm off to uh, Ballarat in rural Victoria um, and we're doing a field trip. Uh, out to a farm, tiny Lola farm, um, and another little regional um, yarn store. Um, so there are beautiful farms you can visit very, very easily from from the city. But yeah, Australia is a funny one. The centre centre is not very well um, populated. Um, the, we tend to sort of hang to the coast, um, and we do tend to live in city centres. And then there's um, these regional hubs. Um, yeah, people don't tend to just live out in the country all on their own. Tell me about your yarn stash. How did that change over the years? <laughs> um, oh, it's definitely, um, I've definitely got become more of a connoisseur. Uh, <laughs> you know, it used to be, oh, there's a sale on it. We have this um, chain called Spotlight. Oh, there's a sale on it, Spotlight. I'm going to dig through the, you know, the sale bin. It was that, that was my kind of big thing was like, how cheap can I go and get something still of okay quality? Um I don't shop at Spotlight anymore. <laughs> um, I sort of feel like I'd rather support small local businesses. Um, I'm really, really keen on following businesses that have a strong farm to yarn story. Um, so that was a big driver for me when I was shopping at Vogue Knitting in that amazing marketplace. Um, I was drawn to those places like a Acre Farm and um, Junction Fibre Mill um, and uh, Nuts and Knits who um, run by women who are farming or engaged with farmers, um, milling it themselves or working with the mills and then they're sharing that, um, there's that total like transparency, that sort of that supply chain is really clear in their minds and they can share that story as well as the beautiful yarn as well. And so, yeah, that's that's definitely something that's driving me at the moment. I still love like things like... Um, I don't know, like a, I've got some La Bienemy and I've got some, um, I really love hedgehog fibres as well. And I have to say, I don't really know what the supply chains are, but I love the colours and I love what, how they knit up. Um, but, yeah, so I, I go through these sort of uh, moments of curiosity where I follow a story and um, and so these farm to yarn sort of brands, they, the story is so kind of uh, key to their brand to so yeah I think that's what tracks me as well apart from it when, being also very environmentally and economically and socially sustainable right well when you buy yarn do you buy one skein two skeins what a quantity yeah I tend to buy one <laughs> um but if I'm making a specific project then obviously but um if I'm just kind of shopping at a yarn store or, or at a market I'll just buy one um and uh I used to be a bit afraid of that to be honest I'd buy like two which is actually not all that helpful or three <laughs> Um, because I thought, oh, I wonder, but it's not quite sweater and it's too much for some other things. So these days I tend to buy one if it's just to, to understand the wool and play with it. Um, that's more the driver. And then it might sort of form inform a, a design. So um, or even actually I really love the Lizzie sweater by So Su Nitz or Suzanne Summers. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that one skein of yarn was enough to do the colour work, the brioche on the, um, the yoke. 
And at that, and then I just had to go and match it with a few other skeins for the body. And I think that's really cool. And I, I wonder if that's because she had a um, a souvenir skein or a particular skein in her stash that she wanted to celebrate. Um, so, yeah, so who knows? Maybe I'll kind of use that philosophy in one of my designs where I want to celebrate a particular skein. Do you have that particular skein that you want to celebrate? <laughs> I have so many. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's a bit yeah uh, nothing that I can think of in particular at the moment I did also I do tend to buy um yarn when I travel so just randomly not necessarily a market or whatever I'll just sort of um uh, sort of scope out a yarn store or whatever and I happened to come across one at the top of a cliff in Ireland <laughs> And it was just a mobile yarn store parked at the top of the cliff. And I bought, I actually bought sweater quantity of, um, on a cone of yarn that I ended up knitting up into a sweater, but that was rare. I don't tend to do that. And it was, um, it was bulky. It took up my um, luggage after that, but yeah, that, that was fun. But I held on to that for about, I reckon it's about four or five years trying to work out what sweater to make with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> If you don't need What else do you like doing? Uh, so I um I sew. I I make my own clothes. That like part of my reason for knitting is that I really believe in slow fashion or even slower fashion, as I like to call it as well. Um, and I think um fast fashion is a, a terrible thing for the environment and for and for people, especially women. It tends to be women who are, um who suffer as a result of fast fashion. So I sew my own clothes. Um, I. I, t I draw a little bit, sketch a bit. Um, uh, I like reading, but I don't tend to have the focus these days. I'll start reading and then I'll be like, oh, I should go do that thing. <laughs> I love gardening. I love indoor plants. I've got quite a collection of indoor plants um, and, and being outside as well. I love cycling. I don't know. I, I, I just love everything, <laughs> eating. <laughs> I love baking cakes and things, yeah. Do you feel yeah. like you like you wish there was another 24 hours in the day? <laughs> yeah, so I could sleep. <laughs> I love sleeping as well. I love napping. Um, but yeah, no, I there's yeah, I feel like oh, the day's just gone. And I, there's there's still the list. So not that I have the list, as I said, but I'll have to like drag over the the task to tomorrow. Like, you know, that's a, another thing I do. Oh, I didn't do that today. All right, that's I'm gonna find a, a time to do that tomorrow. <laughs> Yeah. How long is your wish list of projects to need? Uh, um, I've abandoned my wish list on Ravelry, but there's about 120 on there. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've stopped making a physical list on Ravelry because it was just too hard to keep up. But also I realized that my taste and my inclination towards different projects changes quite, quite a lot. Um, and I just... And usually it's because I go on a journey. Like I want to do everything brioche for a while and then I want to do everything lace for a while or I want to, I've done something very intricate and now I actually need a palette cleanser and I need to do something that's just like garter stitch, you know. So um, and, I, and I definitely am trying to do more designing and less, um, less just replicating making other people's patterns I, th I think there's this, it's sort of like writers go through this process and so do musicians where you just listen to it, heaps of music and and then you realize actually I need to stop listening to music and actually get on my guitar or my piano or whatever and the same with with writing like I've got to stop reading all these books and actually sit and write so I think I go through that but I, I think there's a real value as I said before to uh, for a designer to continue to learn and um and engage with other designers work um uh, even to understand what what kind of the standard is or what's contemporary or what's what's being said out there in the market because yeah it's it's an expression it's a yeah it's a expression of a designer's um uh, creativity and uh design brain mm. was it difficult for you to decide what to pack for walk meeting So difficult. Right? <laughs> Did you have the same problem? Oh my god, it was like the hardest thing ever. 
<laughs> so like I went through this process where, so we've got a spare bedroom, very lucky to have that extra space. And I threw everything on the bed that I thought I might want to take. Uh, and then I slowly culled it down and down and down because um, I'm someone, I don't like taking roll-on suitcases. Uh, it's a weird thing from traveling. I've uh, traveled a lot and I really hate the feeling not being able to run for the train or for the bus or whatever. So I travel with a backpack, but a big one, but a backpack. Um, so I had a limited space. Um, but also I knew that I needed to have space to come home. Like with, I was definitely going to buy stuff. <laughs> so I had to anticipate that I was going to need to like, um, yeah, find room at the end. So, um, yeah, so I culled a few things, but I also wanted to showcase some some skills and techniques. It's a bit of a catwalk um, unofficially, isn't it? A fashion yeah. show yeah. in the marketplace. <laughs> Everyone's like, oh, I like that pattern. Who's that? <laughs> so, yeah, so that was a bit of that as well. And, of course, I had to bring that sweater that I knitted using Nora's design so it, it, just in case I bumped into her and could have herself be wearing it. <laughs> um, but I was actually knitting that right up to the day before. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was a close call. So I wasn't sure if I could include it or not. So I had a backup just in case. <laughs> What's your dream or ambition for Dear Pro? Like where do you see it going? Mm. Um, so I, I see myself... Um, yeah, and this is this is scary to say this, but I I, I want to be the number one person you think of when you think Australian knitting or Australian knitwear design. I want you to think Prue, okay? Um, and I I want to be someone who takes others with me. I want to be a knit influencer in Australia, basically, to help grow our ecosystem because I really believe strongly that I can't grow as a business without my ecosystem growing. Like our our um, knitting scene isn't nearly as big as it is in the US or in the UK. Um, we don't have a publication the size of Pom Pom or Vogue Knitting um, because we just don't have the the I guess the the groundswell the you know the the population with an interest in knitting. Even though wool is one of our number one exports, right. which is crazy. So I really see myself in the next few years partnering with the wool industry, um, working with other um, small businesses, um, really building that farm to yarn story, um, building the, um, the the number of shops as well. We only have like one really really good yarn store in, in Adelaide, and there's not real. There's only maybe two others in South Australia that you could. Like, you know, Knit, Spin, Weave Out in Clare is the next one I think of. And that's two or three hours away. And then I can't think of anywhere else, you know. So I really think building the ecosystem is is a work that I'd like to do with businesses in South Australia so we all flourish and Australia. Um, so, yeah, that's my am ambition. It's, it's pretty big. <laughs> it's pretty big. <laughs> Well, you also recently started a YouTube channel and a podcast. Mm -hmm. Tell me why. Like, yeah, what yeah. So that? it's because of that. It's because of that goal to try to build others' capacity within my ecosystem. Like, I, I'm learning all these different business concepts. Like, I, I was in, in an incubator program last year for creatives, and I learned a lot. And I realized that you kind of need someone to interpret or to put the two bits together because you see on YouTube or you see on Insta, you've got these marketing experts or these business experts, entrepreneurs talking about these concepts and you think, but how does that work in the knitting industry? You know, how does that work in the world of wool? And so I, I've been talking about these things with Jess from Yarn Trail Victoria and in, in our conversations we're like, do you think other people might want to know this stuff you know they might find this helpful in some way and we decided we just sort of record maybe 10 minutes of that conversation that was the initial thought you know our MVP or our minimum viable product which is a you know a key sort of concept in design and business was that we wanted to produce something that shared a business concept within our knitting industry with the lens of the knitting industry but it's kind of 
um, taken on another thing where we have this chicken of wisdom moment and we have a book review and um, yeah so we've got a season done that was last year we've just started season two and we've refined it further um, so it's a BBC so business book and chicken of wisdom <laughs> uh, so you won't get any updates on different events or anything we're not going to bother with that you can find out that information on our in, on our websites and instagram we're always giving updates on events we're hosting um, so we decided we'd just do bbc um, so um, and i think um, I'm well, I'm hoping that it will actually become again, like more responsive people saying, can you talk to us about how you can use like chat GPT with, with your business, with your knitting business, or can you tell us about, you know, how, um, uh, pricing works or what it, which, and we did do an episode on that, but yeah, doing this kind of like conversation piece, really not just about us sort of sharing, but the people having input and we're going to have a lot more um, guests as well um, getting some um, people talking about their experiences in in our ecosystem and sharing their insights with with others so we can collaborate and grow together well I totally can see you as a number one designer in Australia sometimes <laughs> <laughs> thanks sorry <Arena. laughs> I'm like, I'm, I team, I'm team crew, you know, so I wish oh, you the very you. best of luck in that. And I can oh, totally see it happening. I think mm. you, you got what it takes, you know. Oh, thank you. That means a lot. I, it, it does mean a lot to know that in we've got this beautiful connected community around the world. And, um, you know, I, I really do feel that. Um, that people are supporting me and helping me to to grow and I can reach out and ask questions and and be supported so I really appreciate appreciate it yeah well thank you so very much for being my guest today I really oh. loved our conversation yeah me too it's been fantastic thank you <laughs> Oh, 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 oh,